If you've got your Bible this morning, I'm, I'm ready to hit it and get it with you today because we're in a two-part series in case uh, you are visiting today and you weren't here last week. We are, have been talking about battles, great battles that are all through the Bible. And then when we got right to the end of the series, I said, you know, I want to continue the series because the subtitle is The War is One. The war's already won. There's the last great battle that the Bible talks about in the last days. And there are a series of events that set up this great battle that's called the Battle of Armageddon. And even Armageddon has its different pieces that come uh, together during that time. And so I wanted us to take a look at that battle from a prophetic point of view. And so we've been doing that. And it's been, again, a wonderful time. And last week, we talked about uh, some of the scriptures that are the most important scriptures around that particular battle. We talked about 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, where Paul was talking to the church at Thessalonica. And he said to them, I do not want you to be uninformed brethren about those who are asleep and what he was talking about was he was talking about people who had embraced Jesus and now they had died and so people were worried if the Lord comes back what about my dad who's already passed away he knew Jesus but he's passed away what's going to happen to him what's going to take place and so Paul says, I do not want you to be uninformed or ignorant about what's going to take place. So he's giving them a sequence of some events. So he says this, now, th so that those are, that are asleep, because he said, I do not want you to grieve as the rest who have no hope. Now, the scripture also calls the return of Jesus our blessed hope. So Paul is doing a little play on words here, and he's saying, I don't want you to grieve as people who have no hope, because every one of us as Christians, we have this blessed hope in the return of Christ. And then he begins to explain it. For if, if we believe that Jesus died and he rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and we, we remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Now, if you'll notice the pronoun that Paul uses, he says, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive. So what that indicates is Paul thought Jesus was going to come back in his lifetime. And I think that's because so many of us want to believe that Jesus is going to come back in our lifetime, that we're not going to taste of death and that the Lord is going to come and he's going to redeem us back up to, to be with him. And so Paul, I think, really believed that he was going to be a part of that group. And so, you know, we, and he says, we're not, those of us that are alive when, until the coming of the Lord are not going to go before those who have already fallen asleep. So the sequence is, from the time that Jesus came and there were believers in Jesus, all of those that have died, and now we've got 2,000 years of that, those people are going to go up and the first signal that this amazing change is going to happen, the Bible says, it's going to happen in the twinkling of an eye. Before you can even blink your eye, this is going to happen. And he says, now very clearly, I'm telling you, no one's going to know when this is going to happen. No one's going to know. Sometimes people go over to the book of Matthew chapter 24, and it's called the Mount Olivet Discourse, where Jesus was teaching the disciples, and they wanted to know about his return. He begins to tell them about his second coming and what they should look for in the second coming. But the rapture and the second coming are two different things. And think of it this way. The rapture is when Jesus comes for his church, both those that have died and those of us that are awake. In other words, we haven't died. He's going to call us to go up and to be with him. So he's coming for his church. The next time that Jesus appears after seven years of tribulation, he's going to come back and he's going to put his 
defeat on this earth. And this time he's coming with his church. In other words, all of us will be a part of his second coming according to the word of God. For the Lord himself, Paul says in verse 16, will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. It's even interesting that he used singular trumpet because when he uses the word trumpet, he's talking about God's people. And so usually when you were going into a battle like this, there would be two trumpets that would have played, two silver trumpets. It's talked about in the Old Testament. But this time it says there's going to be that one trumpet that's going to be played, and now the dead in Christ are going to rise first. So all of those are going to rise. Then we who are alive and remain are going to be caught up together with them in the clouds, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. And he says, now, therefore, I want you to comfort one another with these words. And so last week, we took apart the tribulation and we took a good long look at it. Then I also took you to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 and 52. He says, behold, I show you a mystery. A mystery is something that is hard to be figured out, right? So you go all the way back through all of the Old Testament. You even go up all the way through the, you know, the life of Christ. And this mystery has not been mentioned as such as we understand it. And that is the return of Jesus. So he says, now, here's the mystery. We shall not all sleep, and that means die. We shall not all sleep, but all of us, he said, are going to be changed. They said it's going to happen in a moment. This is verse 52. It's going to happen in the twinkling of an eye at that last trump, for the trumpet shall sound. Now watch what happens. And the dead are going to be raised incorruptible. You, you know, when a body is put into a grave, no matter how good the embalming is and all the other things, that body is going to begin to decay. That body is going to begin to fall apart and it corrupts. It, it is corruptible. So what he's saying right here in a moment, when no one knows it, in, in this moment, in the twinkling of an eye, all of a sudden the trumpet is going to sound and the dead who are corruptible are going to be raised incorruptible, no more decay in their system. And then he says about us, the ones that are alive, and we're going to be changed. We're going to be changed in a moment. Another way of looking at it for us that are alive, the mortal has to put on immortality. And so we're not going to taste death like other people have tasted death. And so that's the two really most important uh, passages describing the rapture. And so Paul was just trying to answer a question for the people in Thessalonica about what had happened to those people that they knew that had gone on to be with the Lord. What, what's happening there? And so then in 1 Corinthians, he's letting the church at Corinth know, hey, there's going to be this really amazing thing that's going to take place. So if you had started reading the Bible over in the book of Genesis chapter 1, and you read all the way up through 1 Corinthians chapter 14, if you stopped your reading right there, you would have already learned a lot of important facts. You would have learned about creation. You would have learned about man's sin. You would have learned about the flood. Um, you would have learned about Jesus' virgin birth at Bethlehem. You would have learned about his atoning death at Calvary and his glorious resurrection. And you would have learned about the existence of heaven and hell. But you would be forced to conclude, if you were a Christian at that stage, that the only way that you could get to heaven is that you would have to physically die. With the exception of two people, the Bible says that Enoch in Genesis chapter 5 verse 24, this is a pretty cool statement about Enoch, it says, and Enoch walked with God and he was no more. He was just walking one day with God and he was no more. I heard a preacher say it beautifully one time. He said, uh, God and Enoch were walking together and God looked up one day and said, you know what, Enoch, it's closer to my house than it is to your house. Why don't you just come on with me? Would that be a cool way to go right there, y'all? I mean, that would have been a cool way to go. Now, the other person uh, that's pictured as not dying is Elijah. 
Some people think it's Moses, but the Bible says clearly that Moses died and that God buried him. You know, he, he, he buried the, the body there of Moses and the archangel Michael was involved. And, and so the only thing that we could have concluded until we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is that all believers have to travel that path to the grave in order to be able to reach the goal of glory. But now here's what we find out. Everyone that's a Christian and hasn't died when this event that no one knows when it's coming. No one is going to know. It's just going to happen, and that mystery is going to take place. We're going to be able to go to heaven without dying, and we're going to be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. There's at least three biblical passages that talk about the coming rapture. This 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and if you have your Bible with me, get ready because I'm going to take you to the book of Revelation chapter 4 in verse number 1. So just remember that the trumpet of God is very important in this because in the Old Testament, that trumpet was used for two things. It was used to call people to battle, and it was used to summon people to worship. So there were the two different things that were there. And I believe that when it talks about that trumpet being blown at the rapture, I think it involves both of those things. Because I, I think when he blows that trumpet, the angels in heaven know it's time to get ready for battle. Because there's going to be a battle. As we leave this world and go to the next world, we won't be dead or we won't be translated skinny second before we realize what's going on. And I think then and only then are we going to really realize about the powers and principles of darkness that are in this universe. And this present world, let's face it, lies in the hands of the evil one, the devil, and our atmosphere is filled with all of those kinds of things. Do I think the devil is just going to stand back and just let all of these believers go up into heaven? I, I don't think so. And so I think that trumpet is saying, all right, angels, you get ready to battle. And for all of us that are Christians and know Jesus, that trumpet is saying, hey, you guys get ready to prepare to worship. I think it's going to be pretty amazing. Uh, this morning, one of our church members, Esther Pierre, uh, sent me um, a song. And it was by Kirk Franklin, and it was with his choir. And they, they were singing a song about being caught up together in the air with the Lord. And I listened to that thing on repeat over and over and over again as I was driving into church thinking, what is it going to be like in that moment when we're caught up to meet him in the air, when we finally behold him face to face and we realize that this last great prophetic event has happened and we're a part of it. I think we're just going to be absolutely blown away. I think we're just going to be, you know, ab absolutely just feel incredible. So the corruptible, those that supernatural act where the bodies of the departed are going to be resurrected and the mortals, the people that are alive, are suddenly going to get a supernatural body. It's going to be transformed and we're going to go up and we're going to meet him in the air. Now, Paul also writing to the church at Thessalonica says this, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, now listen, what he says that they should do is what every one of us should do. Do not become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy. Do you realize how many people back in 1988 bought a book called 88 Reasons Why uh, the Rapture is Going to Happen in 1988? And you might be interested to know that guy made millions of dollars off of that book. And the whole time that that book was selling, he bought a farm of about 500 acres. Now, if you're a Christian, you really believe you're getting ready to get raptured and you write it in this book, would you go buy a farm? I don't think so. And so date setters are upsetters. Anytime you hear someone saying, oh, well, I know when it's going to happen, you can take this amount of weeks and you, you can measure it. 
that is his second coming. The rapture, no one is going to know. So he says, hey, even if a report or a letter is supposed to have come from us saying that the day of the Lord has already come, yeah, you, you understand that the Bible was put together over 1,500 years. You understand that like First and Second Corinthians, First and Second Th- uh, you know, Thessalonians, uh, uh, all of those kinds of books, those were letters. There were no chapter designations. There were no verses. Those were just letters that were written. And Paul is saying, look, if somehow a letter comes to you and it's contradictory to what we've told you, Don't believe it and do not let it upset you. Verse 3, don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come, and here's where the rubber meets the road. How is that day of the tribulation going to happen? How is it going to take place? Now, Now, watch what happens. That day will not happen until the rebellion occurs. The rebellion. What rebellion? The great tribulation. The great tribulation. And it will occur, notice this, some factors have to fall into place. The gears have to mesh. The man of lawlessness is revealed. Do you ever read articles on who is the Antichrist? You know, is the Antichrist alive today? What are the characteristics of the Antichrist? Where will the Antichrist come from? All of those different things. Well, the Antichrist and the spirit of Antichrist is about lawlessness. And he's saying here, the rebellion will not happen. The full blown is not gonna happen until the Antichrist is revealed. And notice what it says about him. He's a man doomed to destruction. He is a man doomed to destruction. I used to love when we had church on Sunday nights uh, uh, years ago and the Super Bowl was on. You had to go to church to prove that you were really saved. And so uh, they came out with those big, huge VCR recorders. Man, I I was one of the first people to buy one. I had an industrial-sized model so I could tape things. And I would tape the Super Bowl. And then I couldn't wait to be able to get home, have some of that Velveeta cheese with ground beef and, you know, some uh, chips to be able to sit there and to watch the ball game. And I get to watch it on tape because, you know, I'm almost watching it in real time for me because I do not know who has won that game. And one year I couldn't believe, man, I'm coming out of church. I'm so excited to get home, pop on that tape, watch that ball game. And somebody goes, man, the Cowboys really ran right over them. And I was like, no, no one likes the person in a movie that goes, I can tell you what happens and then tells you, no, don't do that. But in this story, God's going to do exactly that. He already knows what's going to happen. He already knows what's going to take place. And, uh, And so here's the deal. We don't have to worry about the outcome because we already know it. We're just, we're just watching it take place. You say, Ike, how is that true? Because God is omnipresent. And when I say he's omnipresent, I just don't mean that he's here at Piedmont Church and over at Westridge Church or North Star Church in their worship services as we worship at the same time. I'm talking about he's everywhere. He is in our past. He is in our present. He is in our future. On Monday night, doing the Armor of God series, I talked about how our sins are forgiven, our sins are being forgiven, and our sins are forgiven out there in the future, and how God is everywhere. He is everywhere. He knows what the outcome is going to be, and he's doomed to destruction. But here's what's going to happen in the in-between time. He will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or his worship. The eradication of Christianity will be his goal. That's what his goal is. Not the eradication of religion. The eradication of Christianity. You say, what's the difference between religion and Christianity? Christianity is about a relationship. Religion is about what you got to do, 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 what you got to do. All these different things you have to keep, do. Christianity is about d-o-n-e. It's already done for us. Every sin we've ever committed has already been forgiven in the atoning work that Christ did on the cross. And all of time is equal to God. 
And so he's saying, look, this is going to be quite a time. And here's some of the ways that you know what's going to happen. He's going to set himself up in God's temple. Where is God's temple? God's temple is in Jerusalem. Which temple is going to be God's temple? I don't know. I, I don't know how exactly this is going to come about. But he's going to set himself up in God's temple, and he's going to proclaim himself to be God. That's what he's going to do. A lot of the way that he's going to position this is he's going to position it through monetary means. You're going to take a mark that's going to be on the back of your hand or on your forehead. Look at me today. Which two areas are the most visible? Backs of my hands, my forehead. You're going to take that mark in order to be able to buy, in order to be able to sell, in order to be able to trade. You say, well, why would people submit to that? Why are we submitting to a vaccine right now? Because we're trying to protect ourselves. We're trying to protect ourselves. And we're trusting in this truth. But in that day, all of a sudden, it's going to be economically based. Why? Because when the rapture happens and all Christians are called out of this world, what do you think is going to happen economically? People could be claiming other people's identities. So if you're going to be a good citizen, if you're going to be trustworthy, all we're asking you to do is just take this little chip here and a little chip here and here so that when you, you, you know, sign in, we can tell exactly who you are, retina scan, whatever, right? So that's what's going to be happening in those days. Now, Paul goes on and says, now look, Remember when I was with you, I used to tell you these things. Can you imagine just sitting around and getting to talk to Paul? That had to be pretty cool. And now you know what's holding him back so that he can be revealed at the proper time. God is a God of process. And he says at the proper time, it's going to be revealed. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. What is the power of lawlessness? It, it's sin. It's already at work. But watch what he, he says here. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until he's taken out of the way. You say, now what does he mean there? I'll tell you very simply. There is a trinity, a holy trinity. God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God the Father is what is holding back lawlessness along with him in this world being in the, the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit indwells all of us as believers. When the rapture happens, the Holy Spirit goes. Because the Holy Spirit doesn't just dwell in a building, doesn't dwell in a rock formation, doesn't dwell in a tree. Doesn't dwell in a dolphin, although they're very cute. You shouldn't worship them. The Holy Spirit of God dwells in believers. Well, all of a sudden, in the twinkling of an eye, all of God's people are gone. It's going to be utter chaos. How in the world are you going to explain the disappearance of this many people? And that's where the lawless one is going to step up. Right now, the Holy Spirit is holding him back, according to verse 7 here. And in verse 8, it says, And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ, here's the spoiler alert for the end of time, whom the Lord Jesus Christ will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. What coming are we talking about? The second coming. You remember, I said the rapture is he comes for his church and we go up to meet him. Then there's the great tribulation. Then there's the second coming when he comes with his church. He came for his church over here at the rapture. Now he's coming with his church, and he's going to set up his millennial kingdom here on this earth, and he is going to destroy the Antichrist, and he's going to be thrown into a lake of fire, and that's what is going to be taking place. So the one who's holding back, I wished I had more time. Boy, do I ever. But let me, let me just take you here for a moment. Because this is the other place where the, the rapture is referred to. John, the apostle whom Jesus loved was John. John was the one, Marlon did a, a great message around this recently. Uh, John was the one who was standing at the foot of the cross with Jesus' mother Mary. And when Jesus was dying, 
He looks down and, and he says, woman, to his mother. And that word woman there is not like we'd say, hey, woman, today. Woman there means a person of highly exalted value. The only other time it's used in the Bible was when the woman was caught in the act of adultery and they all wanted to stone her. And Jesus said, well, whoever's without sin, why don't you be the first one? And nobody has said from the oldest to the least, they started dropping their rocks and walking away. And then it's just the woman and Jesus. And Jesus looks at her and says, woman, where are your accusers? The word woman means someone of highly exalted value. Can you imagine what she felt like in that moment being called a woman of highly exalted value when everybody else wanted to stone her to death? Well, but, so John is standing there with Mary and, and he says to Mary, Mary, behold your son. Now Jesus had other siblings, but when it came to his mother, he said, John, you take care of her. So. I've been to the island of Patmos where Revelation was written. I've been in the cave that history says is the cave where John stayed. I've even knelt down in the, in the grooves in the rock where John knelt and leaned forward on this little, almost a shelf there of rock where it said that John would lean in and pray. And then of course, you know, John later was able to go to the city of Ephesus. It's right off the coast of Ephesus. And he was able to build a church there. And if you take a tour like I did, they also take you to the place, the legendary site where Jesus' mother, Mary, lived. So John did exactly what Jesus told him to do from the cross. And so here's what he says from Patmos. After these things, I looked. Now I'm going to be through in just a second. After these things, I looked, and behold, there was a door standing open in heaven. I don't know about you, but I sure hope when I get to heaven, that door's open. Amen? I mean, I, I just, I'm hoping for that one. And the first voice which I heard, listen to what it sounded like, like the sound of a trumpet. Does that sound familiar? It was speaking with me and said, come up here, and I'm going to show you what must take place after these things. Here it comes, verse 2. Immediately I was in the Spirit. You know what John is talking about right here? The rapture. God gave him a view of the rapture. See, John was told to do three things in the book of Revelation. He said, I want you to write what you see, which is his vision of Jesus Christ. I want you to write about the things which are which is the church age, the church age, that's what you're living in and I'm living in until Jesus comes back and he takes us a church out of this world between the first coming of Jesus and, and the second coming is going to be the tribulation. And then he said, I want you to write about the things which are going to be for hereafter, prophetic things. And so right here when John says, immediately I was called up in the spirit and behold, there was a throne that was standing in heaven. And there was one sitting on the throne, and he who was sitting was like a jasper stone, a diamond. He looked like a diamond, John said, and Sardis in appearance. And there was a rainbow all the way around his throne. Just think, rainbows here are broken, but not in heaven. And it says it was like an emerald in appearance. And around the throne were 24 thrones. Why? 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 apostles of Jesus. The 24, they represent all believers. They, they, that's what they do. From both the Old Testament, those people who believe by faith, and us who believe through the name of Jesus Christ in the Newer Testament. And upon the throne, I saw the 24 elders sitting clothed in white garments and golden crowns upon their threads. Wow, what, what a sight that must be. So that's why the Bible says that uh, we have a blessed hope that we have a blessed hope. See, those, those people that you know and love, your mom and dad, maybe it's your godly grandparents, maybe it was a, a Sunday school teacher, maybe it was somebody that just deeply, deeply touched your life. And they've gone on to be with the Lord. We're gonna get to meet them in the air. See, I had the privilege after becoming a Christian of praying and nailing down my parents' salvation. I've had the privilege of praying with other family members who've now gone on to be with the Lord when they accepted Christ. I don't know about you, but every once in a while I got this lonesome feeling. 
And that launched some feelings when I think about people who've gone on. I think about my buddy Zig Ziglar, who taught me how to be a, a better husband, taught me about loving my kids, taught me about doing things right. And he taught me about how much he loved the Word of God. Every Saturday morning, that phone would ring. And Zig would say, Ike, it's your old buddy Zig. Let's talk about my Sunday school lesson. And we'd just sit and talk about God's Word. I look forward to reconnecting with him. I look forward to seeing my first wife. I look forward to finding out, was our baby a little boy or was it a little girl? Those of you that have miscarried a child, the Bible says that there was a body. And I believe at that moment of conception that God starts knitting that body together. He says if there is a body, there is a spirit as well. I think a lot of you are going to see that child that you thought you lost. You only lost him the realm of this world. You're going to have him for eternity. You really believe that? I do. I've staked my life on it. I trust him. Because the book of Titus says, God can't lie. He can't lie. It's right there in his word. Let's pray together. Father, I love my people. I love opening up the Word of God. I love how many people are in the building today. We're looking forward to more and more coming back. It's feeling a lot more like normal. And I know many of you are watching from home today. Some of you, a lot of this is new. You say, Ike, how can I know that I know that I know that when I die, I'm going to go to heaven? Some of you say, dude, I've been on this earth and it's been hell for me. I sure don't want to die and go to hell for eternity. Then I just want you to pray a prayer. You say, Ike, is it a magic prayer? No, not in the least. It's no abracadabra moment. What it is, is it's you making a commitment because that's what life is about. It's what relationships are about. You make a commitment, the other person makes a commitment to you. Jesus made that commitment to you 2,000 years ago. All of time is divided by his making that commitment to you. And so right now, let's, let's just pray. You say, I want to know that when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. Pray this prayer with me. Just say, I ask you, Lord Jesus, to come into my life. Say to him, if you're unsure, God, I may have asked you there before, but I want to nail it down. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Become my CEO. Become my Lord and declare it to him. It's 12.05. When you get through, write down this date. Write down that time. At 12.05, you nailed it down. Go find your Bible. Put it inside your Bible. So when the devil comes back to say, oh, you've never made a, a commitment, you can look at him and say, oh, well, absolutely, I have. And here's the day that it was done. And I pray you will. In Jesus' name, amen.